So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the GIS Advanced Training on HPC for Computer Seismology. Uh, my name is Jose Gratia from the High Performance Computing Center Stuttgart, and I'm the organizer of this event. I'm not really involved in the uh, technical side of this, so I'm not a computer seismologist. Um, my background is more in theoretical astrophysics, and in the last couple of years I've been doing high performance computing. Uh, could somebody confirm that you're actually hearing me and seeing my slides? Yes, we hear you yeah. and we see your slides. Perfect, thanks. So um, I would like to give you a small overview of the sessions of this workshop. Uh, we have three days, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, on Wednesday in the morning, we will have various introductions. One introduction, for example, is in the usage of Zoom, the software that we're using for teleconferencing. And then there will be introduction into the four codes that we're going to use over the course of the workshop. And that will take uh, most of the morning. And um, later on, we will have lightning talks. Some of you have sent us pre-recorded talks of the work, of the background, what they're doing. And we're going to show them after lunch. And then we will start with the first code exahype and do exercises. And as you might have noticed, I've color coded these things. Um, blue sessions will take place in the main room, main Zoom room. This is the room where we are all uh, together now. And this magenta color here, we will do this in so-called breakout rooms. And I will explain in a minute what breakout rooms are and how to get there. And the green is just to indicate that this is content that has been um, provided by you. So this will be your recordings. Then Thursday, we will have um, the code Sysol lightning talks again, and in the afternoon, Spectrum 3D with exercises. And Friday, we will have the code uh, Salvos with exercises, your lightning talks, a joint wrap up session, and then we will do question and answers uh, for the individual talks. So there will be four sessions, parallel sessions, and where you can ask questions to the individual code owners. So that's a rough um, overview of the sessions. Uh, wait. <clears throat> so instructors, we have a lot of instructors actually here. Um, so we have Vadim, Amandine uh, from CNRS, uh, Alice, Duo, Thomas, Aniko, Bo, Sophie Kuraman, Carsten from the Ludwigs Maximilian University in Munich, uh, Sebastian, Leonhard, Anne, Lukas, Jean Mathieu, Philipp. Uh, from Technical University Munich, and Leon, Michael, and Christian from um, ETH Zurich. Um, so it's a lot of people that are here. I will show you to use their codes and will help you with problems and will help you with exercises. Thanks for the instructors to being, well, to put so much work into this workshop and help this uh, make uh, success, I hope. So the most specific agenda for today is we're going to have a half an hour session uh, with me and doing the introduction as for Zoom and the cluster. And I just see there's a typo there. I wonder why I always find them when I'm presenting, not earlier. And after that will be a short introduction, just explaining what the code does, um, Exahype and the code Sysol. And we will have a half an hour break and then. And after the break, we will continue with the codes, uh, Spectrum 3D and Salvos. And then we will have a lunch break uh, between 12 and 1. I hope this is okay for everybody. And lightning talks half an hour for half an hour after the lunch break. And then is when we really start with the first code, uh, Exahype, and we will do exercises with that. Okay, are there questions so far regarding the agenda? No questions. Maybe you don't know how to ask questions yet. So I'm going to explain to you how to operate this Zoom. Okay, I'm going to give a small introduction into uh, Zoom first and then first steps how to get onto the cluster where we're going to do the exercises. So this is a sketch of the architecture, let's say, of this workshop. Um, can you see my mouse button as well, my mouse? I hope. So you entered the meeting. We are all in the main session here in blue. Um, and most of the presentations, or actually all the presentations will be in this main session. We will be all together. And during the exercises, we will uh, leave the main session and enter so-called breakout rooms. I have numbered here breakout room one to six, or whatever it will be later. 
and um, you have to actively join breakout rooms. So you have to move from the main session to the breakout rooms, and you also have to actively uh, return from breakout rooms into the main session. And you will do that when we ask you to do so. And in the breakout rooms, there will be a smaller number of participants and uh, one or more instructors will be with you in the breakout rooms and will show you um, how to work through the exercises. Instructors and instructors only can move between breakout rooms. So they will be able to help in different breakout rooms. Um, so that's it. And apart from those rooms in Zoom, we also have, sorry, we also have this Slack channel. Um, if you haven't uh, registered yet with Slack, there was an email a couple of days ago with a link with an invitation to join Slack and that you can ask uh, questions as well, or you can actually call for help. If, um, I don't know, if your breakout room doesn't have a, a instructor at the moment. We also use the Slack to try to solve some of the SSH issue, issues. And so you can go there as well. So um, features from Zoom that we will be using in this workshop, there's feature to give instant feedback, it's called in Zoom uh, talk. We have those breakout rooms, which I will explain how to get into them in a minute. Um, you might be asked to share your screen later. At the moment, I'm sharing my screen. So you're seeing the content that I have on my screen. And you might also be asked to grant remote control. So the instructor, but you can grant remote control to any other person, um, mostly the instructors. That means that they can actually type into your uh, screen and uh, use your mouse. So the same as if they would be using your keyboard and your mouse. This is good, for example, if um, the instructors want to show you a particular button or how to do something on a GUI window or something like that. And lastly, there's a way that you can ask for help if you are locked in a breakout room. So giving instant feedback uh, is simple and you can actually try that with me now or you can try that because you're not going to see how I do this. Um, so you should all have this uh, Zoom window in front of you and either the lower button or the top there will be um, an icon bar and just click on the participants icon bar. And if you do that at the bottom of the icon bar, you will see uh, icons like here. Uh, yes, no, go slower, go faster and more. And if you click more, then you can, for example, while testing the slides, raise hand. I actually don't have a raise hand on mine, but um, well, Okay, so maybe we can try this out. Everybody can give me a yes now. Works great. <laughs> okay, perfect. So everybody knows how to do that. Good, and we uh, instructors might use this later. I will actually use it later. Okay, so I was asked to go faster. Um, sorry. So later on, we will ask you to join breakout rooms. Uh, on the same icon bar, there is a menu, there's an icon um, breakout room. Uh, you will get a message on your screen later asking you to join um, the breakout rooms. And when that happens, either click it there or you can break uh, join breakout rooms at any time with this icon on the icon bar. At the moment, there's no breakout room, so you might not see this icon or it will not work. If you're asked to share your screen on the same icon bar in the middle is share screen, and then you will get a menu or a window where you can select um, which screen of your computer or with application window or which file to share. And that's up to you or depending on what the instructors ask you to do. Um, in some versions of the Zoom application, it's important not to move the window while you're sharing. Um, in my case, it works. I don't have a problem. I can move my windows around even if I share them. So granting remote control um, while you're sharing, your menu looks a little bit different. You have a small um, area at the top of your screen then in green and, and red. The red is for stopping to share. And if you hover with your mouse uh, over that, you will get the icon bar that you had previously. And then there's menu remote control 
click that and then you can either request somebody else to give you remote control or you can um, assign remote control to somebody else through this menu. Okay, and finally, if you're in a breakout room, and this is only available if you're in a breakout room and you need help, um, you can press this button, ask for help. This will send a message to the host, that's me. I will be in the main room and then I can I call an instructor and send instructor to you. I don't expect we will need this because we have one instructor per room. So that shouldn't be really a problem. Okay, are there any questions so far? Maybe you can all answer with yes, uh, with this uh, feedback and we try this again. Or you can say with no, no. Ah. Okay, the question whether there's questions that you should answer with no, sorry. <laughs> Fine, it seems to work great. Can you still hear me? Can somebody confirm you can still hear me because my network connection? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I don't know why, but my computer between nine and 10 o'clock in the morning has a problem with the network connection. It happens every morning. It goes down for one, two, three seconds. Okay, um, so I will continue. So the next thing we're going to look at the cluster. And the first thing you need to do is you need to connect to the cluster. Uh, because we will be doing our exercises on one of our uh, HPC clusters here at HNRS. And um, to connect to it, you actually require an account and an SSH client. And if you went through all the paperwork, um, then we have provided you with an account. And the accounts are all structured like this. They start with SCA, uh, five of nine, and then there's a two-digit number uh, that is um, unique to, to you. If you haven't received an email from us with account details, then something went wrong with the paperwork or with the SSH key and things like that. And uh, you can send us an email if that happened, but in most cases it would be too late. Maybe we forgot or we didn't find one of your documents and then we might be able to help that and fix it. But in most cases, if you didn't get the account already, then I'm afraid it will be too late for this workshop. So you will have to uh, ask others um, in the breakout rooms to share their screen and, and you will be able to, to see what they do. Okay, then let's uh, connect to the cluster. So everybody please use the SSH client and connect to the cluster like you've been instructed in email before and most of you have tried this already. If you're using Linux or Mac OS, you do this on the terminal line by type, typing SSH and the rest. And if you're on a Windows machine, most likely you will be using Putty. So please give me feedback if you have succeeded in logging in now. So if you are on the cluster now, and please say no if you did not manage to connect. So half of the participants have managed. Let's wait a little bit more.
Okay. Um, is anybody having problems to logging in now to the cluster, even if it worked previously? Okay, fine. So we have roughly 30 persons in the cluster now logged in. So, <coughs> sorry, um, there's always uh, issues with FSH um, and I've listed here a few of them. A common issue is that you, at least on the command line, when you provide with minus I the identity file, this needs the private key, not the public key. So specify the key that doesn't have the ending dot P-U-B. And that solves half of the problems. Um, other problems are often related to file permissions. Assuming that your key is in directory.ssh where it actually belongs, then you must make sure that only you have access to this SSH directory. Um, further, your private key should only be readable by you. You do this by setting the access rights to 600. And you must also be um, make sure that your public key cannot be written by anybody else. So it's sufficient to set permission 644 on the public key. That is if you have access to command line and are sitting on a Unix like system like um, Linux or Mac OS. I suppose, and frankly, I don't know really very well on Windows that you have to set, uh, set access rights similarly. And also in the Putty um, window, you have to somehow specify the private key and I don't really know how that works. Um, if it still doesn't work, then you can connect to the Slack uh, workspace and go to the uh, channel SSH issues. <laughs> there has been a lot of solutions there already and just give us as much information as you can and we will try to solve this. So um, I will assume that you are on the cluster and I will continue. So setting up the environment on the cluster, the first thing you need to do is, um, or you, the first thing you have to do on the cluster is setting up the environment for this workshop. And I'm going to show this here. So I have a window here, a terminal. Uh, it will be look similar to what most of you have. I'm going to log into the training cluster. I've set up um, my configuration starts that I need just to type training to get there. Sorry, Jose, I was Jose we can't see seeing... you. Oh yeah, okay. exactly. I, was, I said I was going to say we don't see it very well. We see just part of your screen, not the entire screen. Um, <laughs> that was actually my intention. My idea was to have the slides and the terminal side by side. Is this... We don't see the terminal though. Okay. Then and I'm we don't sharing. see the slides either. We just saw part of the Slack uh, channel. Oh, interesting. Okay, let me try this again. So do you see my slides and the terminal? Yes, now it's fine, thanks. Okay. So, to... so I just connected to the cluster. There's this nice, um, welcome message here. So this is a clear sign that you managed to connect to the cluster. And now to set up the environment, uh, everybody should type this command here. Uh, that's a slash shared uh, slash cheese slash setup dot sh. I'm going to do that. And you can do this as well at the same time as I do. Okay, um, the output that I have uh, will not be exactly the same that you have. It's important, the important thing is that you see um, this two lines work okay and geez okay. And the reason it looks different with me is because I executed this command already in the past. Um, 
So I asked everybody to do this and indicate whether this was successful with yes or whether this was not successful with no. Can you then clear the previous yes and no? Um, yes, thanks, yes. Okay, so please um, say yes or no now. Okay, seems to work with everybody. Great, my script is correct. So what this command has done, it actually has created two symbolic links in your directory. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes. Um, one question, could you please increase the size of the font size of the terminal? Uh, yes. Is it better now? A little more, please. Yeah, like this is perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what this has done, it has created um, two symbolic links in your home directory. <clears throat> I know it's... Uh, so one symbolic link is um, cheese. And in this directory later on, you will find all the materials. So instructors will tell you to copy code, materials, uh, files, whatever from this cheese directory. And the other directory that has been created is one that is called um, homework. And this points to a directory on our, on our workspace and um, you are expected or you're absolutely required to do the, all the exercises in this work directory, not in your home. So the next thing that we're going to do is everybody please um, change into this work directory. We do this by typing this command here, cd tilde slash work. Or if you're already in the work directory, then just type cd work. And in this work directory, you can check again. Um, there should be, uh, the script is not working perfectly, I just see. So there should be a file here, okay. And you can check, you can cut this file and this is uh, this work, okay. So if this is a, uh, works for you, um, then maybe give me a yes or no again, and then we would be ready. And before you do any exercise or any work on the cluster, be, please change into this work directory. Don't do any uh, work in the home directory. Uh, sorry, hello. Yeah. Uh, do we have to run the setup.sh every time we log into the cluster or? Uh, it's... No, no, it's just uh, once and uh -huh. the symbolic link shouldn't disappear. In fact, if you create it, uh, if you run it more than one time, then it will create funny directories in your work. So don't do that. <clears throat> but it will, not, it will not be a problem if you do this but you're not expected to. So I have 26, yes. Earlier I had 34, so people are still struggling with that. There's one no. Can you say what is the problem? This person just said no. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. It says there is no uh, directory. There is no such file or directory. And um, when you try when you type this command, this yeah, initial? yes, cd. Uh, yeah, uh, and I, I did that one. Uh, that works. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This one works. Then when I try to get into the work directory, it says no such directory or file. Okay. Then can you see my terminal now? Yes, I can. Do this, just type CD without anything, okay. and then CD space work. Maybe the problem is the tilde. Okay. And if you do that, okay, you should actually see this okay file. No, still it says no such file or directory. Okay. Um, <coughs> Sorry, I need some water. Um, 
then maybe you can in this slide uh, do an ls with you just at the moment. Okay. Ls minus l and post the output of that in the Slack channel, and I will try to solve this. Okay. During the break. Okay. We will not need the computers until this afternoon, the supercomputers, so we still have oh. time to figure this out. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so that's it. Is there any other questions? <clears throat> no other questions? Good, because I don't know if I could answer any more questions. <clears throat> I really need some water. Um, great, so we're done with the first session. And um, who's going to present next? Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, okay, so now hopefully you can all see my slides. Is that the case? Yes, we can see your slides or your whole window. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about doing seismic simulations using the ExaHype engine. Um, I'll be doing this presentation together with my colleague Leonard Rannerbauer from the Technical University of Munich. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, and I was also at the Technical University of Munich until very recently, and I'm now at Durham University, actually. Okay, so what is the ExaHype project? The ExaHype project was initially funded through an EU Horizon 2020 project towards exascale high performance computing. Um, this project has ended, but of course the software ExaHype has not ended and has in fact received follow-up funding through Cheese, um, which is the context of this workshop. So let me briefly introduce the team. So the um, PI in charge of ExaHype is actually Michael Bader, who sadly could not be here right now. Um, and the instructors on this workshop are also pictured here. So I'm the first picture and then there will be Jean-Mathieu Galin, Leonard Rannerbauer, um, Philip Sampas, and Lukas Krenz, um, helping you out with ExaHype. Okay, so here's a rough overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, I'll introduce the engine in a very general way. I'll skip over a lot of parts about how to actually use it, because that's what you'll learn in the tutorial in a hands-on way. Um, then I'll start focusing on seismology. Um, so I'll talk about the elastic wave equation and two different methods that we have um, to put in um, topography. And then um, Leonard will take over and he will talk about perfectly matched layers and the GPR model. Okay, so what was the goal of ExaHype? So ExaHype um, stands for Exascale Hyperbolic PDE Engine. And the idea was to construct something which works um, as a PDE engine where engine is intended like a game engine. So it should give Sorry, you- Sorry, excuse me, can I interrupt you? Could you please increase the zoom in of the slides? No, because then you won't see the entire slide. You don't see the slide, Anna. You see your screen, and not in the full, full screen mode. It's not in the full screen mode. It's not in full screen mode? No. Okay, it is on my computer, so that's very strange. In fact, I see two slides. Okay, that's really bad. Um, so presentation mode just doesn't work like this. Um, sorry about that. So for me, I see the presentation, so this is really strange. <laughs> um, and then, do you have two screens? No. Okay, then. Let me try something. Know. I'm switching. How about this? Yes. We see perfect, the perfect, thank you. Okay, so that's, okay. Anyway, sorry about that. Let's continue. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the, the goal here was to construct a game engine um, by which we mean that we will provide the numerics um, and everything in the background. And the only thing that the user does is implement their actual PDE system on top of it. And this was in order to allow medium-sized interdisciplinary research teams to realize extreme scale simulations very quickly. And the numerics that we decided on or that were decided on um, were um, Cartesian grids um, and high order ADRDG. 
with subcell limiting. So I'll talk a little bit about what that means later on. And the primary focus was on two application areas. The first is astrophysics and the second is seismology, which is all that we're going to focus on today. So this is the general form of PDEs that the X-Hype engine can solve. So you'll see that it's very, very general. It can essentially solve um, anything that's hyperbolic and a few things that aren't actually as well. Um, so what you have here is, of course, you have a time derivative. You can allow for a material matrix P. Then you have flux terms, which are conservative fluxes that you can allow. Then you can also allow for non-conservative um, terms. You can allow for sources. And this one here is to denote point sources. So all of these are things that you can have in your PDE system if you want to use XI. If you have any other terms, then you generally can't use this software. Okay, and here are the components of the engine. So essentially, um, the main part of the numerics is using eta DG. So a DG method is um, assuming that uh, you have separate uh, solutions in each element, if you like, and they don't have to match at the edges of the elements. And so we want to use high order. So we use an approximation with a high polynomial order, generally something uh, around five or six um, in the case of seismology, I think. Leonard can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, and in astrophysics, generally high order is already something like a polynomial degree of three. So then we only have the issue that when we're using a high order method, we generally get some spurious oscillations if there's a discontinuity. And we resolve that by just switching to a finite volume scheme in those areas. So we do finite volume limiting. Um, the next part of Exahype is code generation. So that's what allows us to keep all the numerics um, away from the user. So as a user of Exahype, you generally don't need to look at the numerics at all. And um, the last component is, of course, the grid. So we use only Cartesian grids. And I'll talk about why that's not as big a restriction as it initially seems um, in a second. And the last thing that we should probably just mention is that it uses um, AMR. So it allows for adaptive mesh refinement. So you can see here that in this corner, um, there's a lot more elements than uh, in the center, for example. And we allow for adaptive mesh refinement in a dynamic way. So that means your mesh can change over time. OK, and so here's the actual application interface. In sort of um, a turquoise color is all the parts that a user generally has to interact with. So most of it is hidden from the user. And the application layer essentially provides you um, with some templates that you need to fill in as a user, where you will put your fluxes your sources, and so on, because we don't know what system you want to solve. You'll also have to provide eigenvalues um, for the time step restriction, but you don't actually need to know all of them. In general, it's enough if you know the maximum eigenvalue of the system you're solving. And then your XIHYPE toolkit will um, generate a whole bunch of core routines and kernels for the numerics and so on in a uh, way that's actually specifically tailored to your problem and also to the machine that you're working on, as long as you've specified it. And the piano framework, which is underneath all of this, is what actually provides the adaptive mesh refinement. And it also provides the parallelism, which in Exahype is done in a hybrid way. So there's MPI for distributed memory. And then there's Intel's TBB for shared memory parallel. And in general, the approach that we always take is that we use both. So um, we don't do pure MPI most of the time. OK, and so the flexibility of the engine um, allows us to implement a lot of different PDE systems in Exahype. Um, so we've got the Euler equations. That's one of the first equations we started with. We can solve for tsunamis in the shallow water equations. And then in bold, I've put the ones that we'll talk about now, um, which are the ones that are relevant for seismology. We can have curvy linear meshes with the elastic wave equation. We have a diffuse interface approach, and I will talk about what that even is. Um, we have perfectly matching layers for the elastic wave equation, which Leonard will talk about. Um, 
We can also solve the compressible neighboring Stokes equations, which are not actually hyperbolic, um, with some tricks in exahype as well. We can solve general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. So as I mentioned, our other application area was astrophysics. That's why that's in there. Um, and the godunov peshkov romensky model. Um, and we can also solve, to some extent at least, for gravitational waves with Einstein's equation in the back. OK, so it's a very flexible engine. And we will focus now on the seismology aspects of it. So here's the elastic wave equation, which I think most of you are probably familiar with. Um, we have stresses, we have velocities, um, and here we have a material matrix, which is only depending on the Lamy constants, not that mu. Rho is the density here. Yeah, so as I said, sigma is the stress tensor and V is the velocity field. And so right now we're solving this on a Cartesian grid, on a cube, and there's no topography, as you can see, it's flat. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to somehow introduce topography on this. And that was part of the motivation for why exahype is the way it is. So mesh generation um, generally requires a lot of time, um, both in runtime as well as in time on part of the developer. So you often require commercial software and you usually need to tweak your mesh to make it um, actually work, which means that someone has to invest a lot of work into this. And so what we want is we want something which takes a topography and possibly a fault and then automatically generates the meshes that we need. So in XIP, we take, as I mentioned before, two different approaches, the curvilinear mesh approach with automated mesh generation and the diffuse interface approach is an approach which will entirely avoid the problem of mesh generation. So there's no meshes in that. So with curvy linear meshes, I think this is a fairly well-known method. Um, you simply map each element from a Cartesian mesh onto a boundary fitting curvy linear mesh. So all this is, is it's taking the cube from the previous picture um, and slightly deforming each of the elements. So that's what you see here on the left. And this requires an initial automated mesh generation. And here the flux and the source terms are transformed um, I'll show you the equation by which they're transformed on the next slide. Um, but what this means in practice is that the eigenvalues and as such the time step size um, depend on the norm of the transformation. And that means if you have some very steep elements in your discretization, your time step size will become very small. So this is basically a method which works best if your topography is flat. Um, but yeah, okay. So here's the modification of the flux. So J is the Jacobian. Um, and now we've just multiplied this in here all over the place. And that's everything we need to do. So we change this, and then we have the curvilinear mesh that we want. So how do we do this? Well, we start by generating some quadrature nodes depending on the topography. So that's seen here. Um, and we interpolate these using the easy library. So easy is something that you can find on GitHub if you like, and it's something Exahype has an interface to. If you want to um, read in mesh data with Exahype, then that's what you're going to use. And then we introduce a 2D curvilinear interpolation of the quadrature nodes on the boundaries. Then we will extend this into 3D. And from the whole transformation, we can now generate a Jacobian at each quadrature node. And that's what we then put back into our equation, and then we can solve. So next, let's have a look at the diffuse interface approach. So this one's a little bit more unusual. And the idea here is we just work entirely with our Cartesian mesh. So we'll just stay on a cube, um, but we'll introduce a parameter which tells you where there is a solid medium. So this parameter here is just called alpha. And this alpha um, is one if you're inside the material and it's zero if you're outside. And if you're in an element which at the, is at the interface, then it's something in between, depending on how much um, volume of material is in that cell. So now our state vector, which is the vector of variables that we're solving for, has been expanded. So it still has the stresses sigma and the velocity v. Um, and here we're just carrying our parameters, um, which actually don't change over time 
with us in this vector as well. So the Lamé parameters, the density, um, and now this new parameter alpha, which we will assume for now is not moving. Then the main issue that we have is that at the boundaries, the fluxes are no longer linear. Um, but as an advantage, we completely avoid the problem of mesh generation. And our eigenvalues and time step size are now independent from the topography, which means that if the topography is changing a lot, um, we don't have to um, go with a very small time step size anymore. And the other thing is, so here I've said that the um, alpha should um, not change over time, but we can remove that restriction actually. And then in this case, um, this method allows us to very easily have moving meshes if we want. Okay, so here are the actual equations. So you can still recognize the um, standard elastic wave equation. There's now a component that's new, that's this one over alpha, then a gradient of alpha times the velocity. And this term is also new. Um, yeah, and then we have some new terms in here as well, but essentially you can still see the form of the original equation. And if you insert alpha equals one here, then you'll see that you basically get back immediately to the standard elastic wave equation you had before. If you insert alpha equals zero here, then you will just be solving zero equals zero, which is what you want to solve outside of the domain. And if alpha is somewhere in between, then of course you need to invest more work now. And this is where the limiter actually comes in. So in this case, you will also have to use the limiter that I mentioned before. So at the boundary, you might, might need to use finite volumes. Okay, so now the mesh initialization has reduced to finding this parameter alpha. And the question that um, immediately pops up is how do we actually find alpha? Um, and the main uh, condition that we require is we want to have a free surface boundary. So we want the gradient of alpha to be pointing in normal direction as depicted here. Um, and so if T is now an arbitrary point on the topography and N is the normal, then essentially we end up with a nonlinear optimization problem. So that we don't actually solve. What we do is we just approximate by considering samples. So we just check certain points and then we choose an alpha. Um, and that works quite fine. Okay, so you can see the results here. So this is an earthquake in the Trento region, um, which we simulated a very long time ago. Um, with the diffuse interface approach. So these um, kind of discontinuities in the topography you can see up there um, are actually more of a plotting artifact than anything else. Okay, and I think at this point I will hand over to Leonard. Okay, before I start, do you hear me? I hear you. Okay. Um, and let me share my screen. Share here. So can you see the slides? Yes. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um, yes, so so um, what we're doing with these two methods are studies in the area um, around the Zugspitze. Um, and we're investigating in how far those different components um, of the curvilinear mesh having an effect on the on the time step size and the diffuse interface method not having an impact on the time step size but being more expensive in how far um, uh, we, we see which method is, is better suited to solve these problems. So what you can see on the left is a benchmark we designed around the Zugspitze and um, on the lower bottom are seismograms uh, with which we investigate um, an, an effect called wave scattering. Right, so the next model um, that we are looking at is the perfectly matched layers method. Um, so for this method, our paper got accepted last Sunday at Numerische Mathematik, so that's really nice. Um, when you think of a simulation in a, in a finite domain, you usually run into the problem that absorbing boundary conditions are not perfect. And this leads to reflections, which then again disturb the seismogram. So this is what you can see here on the left. In green are the reflections which you get from the not perfect boundary conditions. So um, the blue line or the red line here is, is the analytic solution. 
Um, and you see that it has an influence on the amplitudes and also um, at the end of a simulation, um, it disturbs the seismogram. Um, so what we did is we implemented PML based on a technique which is called complex coordinate stretching. And actually the main contribution of our paper um, is that we were able to do this in a numerically stable setting. Um, for that, we had to extend the G fluxes, um, inter-element procedures, and boundary procedures. Um, yeah, and the, the right adjustment of these terms guarantees us numerical stability. Um, so what other codes usually have to do is that they extend the domain in, in a way that reflections propagate far enough away from the interesting domain. So, you, so they don't disturb your seismograms in the end. This is something that works. Um, but it, lets, it adds an additional domain, it adds additional cells to your simulation, it makes it more expensive. This is something that we don't have to do. So in PML allows us to only simulate the area of interest. Um, and the result is on the left in red. Um, yeah, so actually we, we try to plot the analytic solution in blue here, but our red solution pretty much covers it perfectly, so you, you cannot see the difference. Um, yeah, and so this PML allows us to simulate without having, having to consider those reflections anymore. Then we have the last model that we implemented in, he in ExaHype. Um, this is based on the godunov peshkov romensky model, um, which is a unified framework for arbitrary rheological responses of materials. Um, this is work done by Alice Gabriel and Duo Lee. And their goal is to numerically model continuous damage and freely evolving dynamic rupture. So in their case, uh, the GPR model is used as a description of nonlinear elastoplastic and uh, material damage. So in this model, the fault geometry and also secondary cracks become part of the PDE and are modeled by a scalar function Xi, which is called um, damage function, as far as I remember. Um, and this models, models the local level of uh, material damage. So on the left, you can see one of their results. Um, the benchmark is a two-dimensional version of the um, TPV3 benchmark. And uh, you have this general fault that is part of the benchmark, but you also get secondary cracks um, also called shear cracks in this case. And in the, in the standard default model, you wouldn't get those. This would be part of, of the results. Right, so this was the last model. Um, let's come to the conclusion. So um, Anna and I have shown you a very large collection of different models. Um, and we can solve all of those in a single code. The problem is that this leads to a lot of challenges that we have to tackle. So we have lots of functionality, which has to be maintained and tested. Also different applications require different targets for parallelization and optimization. Um, our numerical scheme is very flexible because we want to solve a lot of different applications. Um, but because of that, we cannot predict what the cost of a single DG cell will be. Yeah, so this is one of the main problems. Uh, we solve this with a task-based paradigm um, for unpredictable workloads. The task processing is built on a producer-consumer pattern um, with the assumption that volume operations are significantly more expensive than boundary operations. So this is one of the main restrictions um, for a good performance of our engine. Um, yeah, for AMR, we follow one particular strategy which allows different granularity for different applications. We have a communication avoiding traversal scheme to minimize data transfers. Um, and in the end, code generation is, uh, produces tailored kernels for the required uh, hyperbolic PDEs. Um, so you will work with the code in our tutorial this evening, but you can also download it at exahype.org. And we have a second homepage, exahype.eu, with uh, statistics, galleries, and a publication list. Right, and you will use this engine this evening in the tutorial to implement the two-dimensional 
um, elastic wave equation in first order formulation with a point source. Um, and we will simulate the homogeneous half space problem. All right, thanks for your attention. And, uh, now to your questions. Are there any questions? Apparently not. Anna, Leonard, did you want to present anything else or should we continue with the next presentation? No, I think we're finished. <clears throat> okay. Or Anna, do you something? No, no, I think it's fine. We just wanted to leave some time for questions. <laughs> okay, so there's still chance for questions. Uh, hello, yes, I have a question. Uh, so, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Andy. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to know other DG stands for what? DG, I guess, discontinuous galerky. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and the first part, other or ADAR, I don't know how it's to say. Arbi, it's arbitrary um, derivatives. That's what, what it's standing for. So, um, the, the idea of ADAR DG is that you. Um, so when you think of the, the standard Runge Kutter DG, um, you do your time integration with Runge Kutter. In the, in, in the case of Ada DG, you approximate your solution also in time by a polynomial. And um, you can increase the order of the method by just increasing the polynomial degree of the, poly, of the approximation in time. And that's how you end up with these arbitrary um, high order derivatives. Uh, uh, so, sorry, uh, so, uh, another question. So it's high order in a space and time? Yes. Yeah. That's what you end up with. So the nice thing is that, that you can get this high order in time um, without having to, to solve a Riemann problem for every, for every stage. So that's what you would normally have to do in, in the Kutta methods. In ADDG, you can you just have to solve it once for each time step and uh, still get get a high order. Yeah. So there's another question. I missed a point in the diffuse interface approach. When is alpha between zero and one? Um, yes. So so first. Um, Alpha equals one represents solid and alpha equals zero represents the, the vacuum. And um, so in the G methods, uh, we, have a, we have a polynomial pro approximation also of our, of our material parameters. So in the interface between one and zero, um, you will have a polynomial and this polynomial, yeah, as it's, as it's continuous will, will be in the range between zero and one. Okay, any more questions? Oh, there's another. Leo in the chat, um, there's another question. You mean for the for the PML uh, example? Um, yes, so you have to, so to ensure numerical stability, you have to add additional penalty terms to your remote problem. Um, and also inside your volume, your volume, you have to add uh, additional um, yeah, additional terms to guarantee that the PML method works the right way. Um, so, if you want to, if you want to see the, if you want to see the details, uh, there's a preprint of our paper on archive. You can look at those. <clears throat> okay, so I'm. Ah, sure. Okay. Um, 
So is there any difference between PML exahype uses with other methods like finite differences? So I know that this complex coordinate stretching is also used in, in um, finite difference codes. Uh, there's WaveQ lab from Kenneth Duro, which, which implements it. Um, but as far as I know, so there are also other methods that, I, um, that are there to accomplish PML. Um, yes, so this is what we end up with the, uh, in the end. So the question is, are, are there some kind of special elements? So the idea is this, this PML method is computationally quite expensive. So what we do in the end is that we just put it um, in a layer around our domain and inside the domain, we keep the standard elastic wave equation. Um, hmm, computational electromagnetics, Anne. Uh, do you know what we do there? Um, I don't think that we've got a real application in the sense of um, that anyone's implementing any, anything other than test cases, but um, I think some people have implemented electromagnetics, yes. In, in sort of test cases, I, as my understanding was that for anything that's that's kind of applicable um, that someone's interested in, you need complex geometry again, um, and then you would have to add in an approach like diffuse interface because curvy linear generally won't work if you're interested in a part that doesn't just have like a surface just extension in one direction. So that's kind of something that we never found a user for. Okay, is there any more questions? Otherwise we're perfect in time. And I would like to ask the SISOL team who's going to present there. Yes, I will try and share my screen. Perfect. Let us go ahead. Can you see the full screen now? You see a cheese? It's yes, we see a cheese now. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, so the next 30 minutes are reserved for introducing SISOL. So this is the second computational um, method that we'll be training in the next few days. And um, my presentation is a bit more general. Um, and maybe I start also with explaining the scope a little bit of this, of this training. So um, in the cheese project, and uh, we will have the coordinator of the cheese project speak to us at the very end of the workshop. Uh, we have um, a range of different methods that are um, participating in the broader application range of uh, computational seismology. And what we thought would be useful for this training is to give um, the interested users uh, a really good overview of the special capabilities of each of these methods. So we've heard about extra hypes just before, which um, I hope came across as a very, very general engine. Um, and in the scope of this generality, there have to be some choices in terms of um, uh, the discretization, for example, or the, 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 you have to use the Cartesian mesh have to be made. And then this has implications of what is possible and how you have to resolve certain equations. For the SISOL part, which also uses an A to DG scheme, but is really suited for especially earthquake computational earthquake seismology, uh, we decided in this training that we focus also on how to model um, long and complex earthquake forces using this tool. 
So the training examples and also this presentation kind of focuses on computational earthquake seismology. So how can we model seismic base propagation as you see in this cheese, but linked not to point sources, but to finite kinematic sources and especially dynamic rupture sources. And this is a nonlinear problem where we're interested in the physics of earthquakes and how we can model that together with base propagation. Okay, so these are just two typical use cases that we will cover also um, in the next few days, uh, ranging for computational seismology. So that's of course global seismic wave simulation. So here on this slide, there's um, um, a global example of a forward model producing um, synthetics for the 2009 Latvia Italy earthquake in a um, global simulation using an unstructured tetrahedral mesh. So we see little triangles discretizing the globe here. And this is just a schematic view of what I mean if you're interested in not in sources as you hear, but in extended and potentially complex earthquake sources and link that to um, the synthetics purely based on the wave propagation part. And um, these problems are linked. So computational seismology itself has really a pioneering field has also itself been pioneered by high performance computing. And that is also the motivation, I think, for having this link training, um, introducing you to how to use a cluster, how to SCP data, how to um, use a work directory properly with applications of computation seismology. So that's in decades of um, joint development in these, in these areas. Um, the reason for that is that seismology is typically data rich, but we have data only at surfaces. We can't really see what is below these surfaces easily. Um, and it can often be treated as a linear system. That makes it very easy, actually, to, for example, set up um, inverse problems. And the key activities in computational seismology traditionally is the calculation of synthetic seismograms and 3D Earth nowadays, and then using that for solving seismic inverse problems. And the common approach, I think also all that we covered um, the next days, is to do this by obtaining time domain solutions of the space dependent seismic wave field. Um, solved by domain decomposition. And by that, I mean that we're splitting up our model domain into different chunks that are then can be treated in one way or the other using um, a cluster, so a, a parallel compute system. Um, the ongoing challenges are in general, if you want, would like to list them in a general approach, um, 3D Earth structure, um, including not only the elastic properties, but also anisotropy, poor elasticity, um, or very small scale structure that uh, is affecting the high frequency content of the, of the base field. That links to computation efficiency. So it's, you will hear, I'm sure, later in the, in the spectrum and then the salvos part, it's a, a, large, a huge computational challenge to be able to stretch to the high frequencies, especially on the global scale. Meshing, I already heard a little bit about that, having complex geometries and the need for community solutions. The spectrum, a very nice example of a long standing community code. Um, the SISO and XIVE are trying to get in the, in the same direction. And so I was um, taking a, a little bit of a different approach that they will explain in their presentation. Okay, I have a provocative quote here from Jerome Trump, uh, who basically stated, um, I think in one of his AGU plenary talks, that the forward problem for seismic wave propagation is solved. Besides these ongoing challenges, but in principle, um, we know how to treat the forward problem. The story is very different if you're talking about computational earthquake seismology. And the visualization that is shown here is a um, dynamic rupture a scenario for the 2016 Kaikoura New Zealand earthquake. So before this first earthquake sequence, that was arguably the most complex earthquake observed to date. And, um, you can see here already these uh, gray uh, layers that are representing the fault. And um, you're solving in these simulations frictional failures, with spontaneous crack propagation across these faults, coupled to the seismic waves that are emitted every time the slip rate is changing. There are certain specific challenges for that kind of problem that I list here. So, earthquake source processes are extremely ill constrained. We have very few, um, even near field observations, that we can use to get a better handle on that. We have to upscale laboratory experiments uh, to understand the frictional interaction at this fault surface. Um, but in terms of actual in situ observations, it's very ill constrained and it's highly nonlinear. We also have to 
um, kind of decide which holistic processes we think are dominant and relevant um, at a given spatial temporal scale that we model for real earthquakes and if we can justify or um, afford to include the simulation. And, and this is the more technical aspect, we have to think about how we can assimilate the available knowledge in a suitable manner for the software at hand, so in terms of the numerical discretization, the measures we have, uh, we can use. Um, somebody has to mute themselves. I think Rolf. Thanks. In terms of the solvers and in terms of the equations that we solve. So the example that was shown um, as part of the XLAB applications where you've seen this um, mesoscale scale um, shear cracking and dynamically evolving during earthquake failure. That was um, not the elastic wave equation in the way that we typically look at it, but a very different mathematical model. And in terms of hardware, so how to scale these things if we're looking at heterogeneous high-performance computing systems um, with accelerators and how to think about energy concerns. <coughs> so how to um, design codes that are also energy efficient. Okay, so this is um, an animation of the earthquake um, cascading through this uh, segmented fault system here in a kind of a mixed faulting style. So we're having um, strike slip and um, trust faulting. Uh, the earthquake is jumping from segment to segment of multiple rupture fronts and the seismic wave field being emitted by that. So in a dynamic rupture simulation, we're solving um, for the spontaneous, so this is not prescribed dynamic um, earthquake rupture as a nonlinear interaction of the friction of failure and seismic wave propagation. And we define an earthquake to be fictional shear failure. There's no opening of these faults allowed, no mode one failure or shear failure of critical solids under compression along pre-existing faults. So these faults are predefined. And to do that, we typically bootstrap our methods that are stemming from classic computational seismology, like CISO, um, so that were not developed originally for earthquake source modeling. This is our typical workflow. Um, I want to point out that these kind of models are very suitable for pitching scales and also disciplines. So doing that, especially uh, empowered by supercomputing, allows us to integrate and to also later interpret um, a full range of observations. I will show you some examples on how we do that. Our input, uh, typical the um, fault stresses. So how are these faults loaded? It can be heterogeneous. Um, geology I mentioned here, but this in reality means, um, for example, high resolution topography, bathymetry, um, ideas we have from tomography or from other um, sources about um, the subsurface fault structure and friction experiments that um, where we get empirical derived friction laws to describe the frictional strength and what happens after the onset of failure, how the effect propagates along these fault interfaces. We have to generate a mesh. I mean, discretizing our domain and that's the input for a solver. We're getting synthetic observables, so it can be seismograms or synthetic um, hybrid geodetic data, um, surface displacements, tsunamis that are sourced by our models or other things, um, ground deformation and everything that happens along these faults. I have a slide about kinematic of fixed source modeling because the first training example we will do tomorrow is actually how to implement um, a kinematic source. Um, and here, this is taking one step back and it's prescribing also a complicated and extended earthquake source, but it's um, not solving for um, the physics of earthquake rupture propagation, but it's typically used, for example, for solving the inverse problem to imaging earthquake sources. Or what you will do is you're using one of these models that has been proposed and just uh, produce synthetics uh, for a certain earthquake. So here this um, idea is, um, a standard inverse approach. So we're using um, the representation theorem. So it can be simplified to the Terra's formula, but it just means that ground motion can be seen um, as the sum of the convolution of the source signal and the structure signal. And here we're interested in the, in the source signal. And what is done is that you're discretizing um, a prescribed geometry of the earthquake fault into a lot of sub patches. And each of these sub patch can be described by a point source, so a moment tensor with a source time function. And seismograms are then calculated for arbitrarily complex finite sources by adding up these seismograms from the position number um, of point sources. Um, they are timed and scaled to correctly reproduce in the sum 
the source behavior, the kinematic source behavior that was observed. <laughs> the other two examples that we will go through are um, dynamic rupture problems. Um, so as I said before, this is treated as an elastodynamic problem, so elastodynamic wave equation with an embedded frictional interface. There's an interesting length scale and cohesive zones or the process zone size um, that's going, going back to fracture mechanics. So I have a sketch of um, a typical um, 2D crack, how it's treated in fracture mechanics here. And you would see there's some region of validity for um, the approximation of linear elastic fracture mechanics. Um, so there's a little bit of the theory, um, maybe the, the way of thinking behind these problems. But in general, you could think about this um, as illustrated in the sketches here, that we have um, a fault prescribed. Here's just this horizontal line. Uh, shear loading stores elastic energy, and additionally, slip is prevented by frictional traction, so this is locked. Um, once you reach um, a failure criterion, it can be, in most cases, this is um, a simple, or in some cases, this is as simple as a, a more Coulomb failure criterion, you would have Movement starting, so slip starts, material fails, stress drops, and uh, this radiates elastic waves, which create ground motion. <clears throat> and also transmits forces along the fault and uh, drives the structure uh, to propagate. In the methods that we're using, um, this is then implemented as a boundary condition in terms of contact and friction, which I sketch here. Um, as I said before, we typically don't allow opening, and it's an infinitesimal thin fault. So this is really um, something that's not extended classical. So we have two matching fault surfaces that are always in unilateral contact. And along this surface, there will be a discontinuity evolving. That's the slip as the earthquake propagates the offset. And uh, much of the complexity lives in the definition of the friction, um, which bounds shear traction um, and balances this with the fault strength that changes during time dynamically. Other complexities are fault geometry, intersection of faults, and um, <clears throat> uh, the interaction in, in, within a fault system, and also with, for example, free surface topography or material contrast. Um, in spec firm, for example, and also in typical finite difference codes, this can be implemented by splitting the fault interface. So then you would just split the nodes um, and you would, these would be communicating with each other in one way or the other. And guys, we don't do that. We're not splitting the fault interface, which is implementing all of the physics um, in a discontinuous Galerian numerical flux. An important message is that all of these dynamics are not predetermined, but this is really a part of the solution. So it evolves as a consequence of the initial condition and the friction law. Um, this is just to illustrate again that this is the um, constitutive flaw in the volume, which is just um, elastodynamics. And on the surface, we are prescribing um, this kind of frictional boundary condition, which can be, for example, shear traction equals friction coefficient times the normal stress. Okay. Um, as you see, often if you're using, for example, finite difference, finite element, or spectral element methods, is that uh, this handling of the strong discontinuity during uh, the dynamic rupture problem on the fault is causing spurious oscillations. And um, a typical way around this is that you're including um, a damping layer. So there could be um, a thin layer of one or two cells surrounding the fault, um, damping out the spurious high frequency oscillations. So it's quite challenging for us to have this strong discontinuity in slip, but especially also in the stresses evolving um, as the earthquake source and so on. Okay, here are some examples which I label as the ideal world, and that is the second training example that we will go through. So there's a lot of um, community benchmarks that uh, many different codes can solve in a very good agreement. One of them is a dipping fault <coughs> and an earthquake propagating up dip here. And if you look closely, you can see that there's this kind of um, second rupture front, there's two rupture fronts here. And what happens is that um, in the example that we will solve, this earthquake goes super sheer. And um, here's a nice example um, from the work of um, Lucille Kuhat um, in the laboratory where you can see um, here would be our fault. And um, you can see here's the rupture tip propagating and um, the earthquake jumping super shear. That means it propagates faster than the S wave speed of the surrounding material, which stacks up um, shear waves here leading to this MAC cone similar to an airplane 
um, flying faster going supersonic speeds and having a, a macron uh, from a, made from acoustic waves. In the real world, um, we have much more complicated systems. This is a, a map of the Southern California fault system. You can see that these faults um, are intersecting. They are, have some morphology. They're curved. And we also have to co uh, cover a large um, range of length scales. So these faults can reach up to hundreds, or in terms of megatrust, or thousands of kilometers. And we do have to resolve what I said before, the process zone. So the length scale at the rupture tip over which the stress drops from um, the loading value to the dynamic value during rupture. And we also have a lot of very interesting um, physical effects that we could study, ranging from biometric effects of different rocks on each side of the fault, fault roughness. These faults are supposed to be fractally um, deviating from planarity on all scales, um, feedback mechanisms across time scales, and thinking about modeling the whole earthquake cycle. And um, this is a list that is still growing continuously as we have new research in earthquake physics from the laboratory, from simulations and from observations um, being added. Okay, so the tool that we will be training you on is called SISOL. It's a 3D dynamic rupture tool as we will use it um, using also the ADA DG method. So that is the same numerical scheme that um, ExaHype is using. ADA DG, as we said, as a discontinuous Galerkin scheme, which allows us to use these unstructured tetrahedral meshes, make, making it very suitable for accounting for complex geometries. And ADA is just a, a little bit of an exotic um, time discretization we're using here, which turned out to be beneficial for many applications. And we will always have the same high order of accuracy in space and, and in time. So these are linked. And there's a couple of references here. It's a unique modeling framework um, because by design, it permits, as I said, representing complex geometries, discretizing the volume via unstructured mesh, in this case, a TET mesh. We can account for heterogeneous media properties, so elasticity, viscoelasticity, suplasticity, anisotropy, and poroelasticities um, on the way of being optimized at the moment. It's easy to get um, multiple component um, into this discretization. For dynamic rupture, as I said before, we are representing the fault, um, everything that happens in terms of friction on this fault um, as an internal boundary condition and changing the flux term, the solution to the Riemann problem, as Leo uh, mentioned. And we have higher accuracy, the higher order method, um, enabling also static mesh refinement. You can zoom into regions of interest, and it's very suitable for parallel computing environments. And there's and just a couple of record setting simulations shown here. So um, in 2014, this method was the first one that kind of um, reached the magical performance milestone of the uh, one petaflop in Munich. And um, yeah, if we are preparing that code as part of the cheese program to go to extra scale from petal scale. Um, here's a slide explaining a little bit the reasoning behind choosing this kind of discretization. So this continuous Galerkin is not only a high order method, it also enables us to propagate waves or many wavelengths with low numerical dispersion. Um, we can, using these unstructured meshes, actually account for intersecting and branching faults and structure. We don't have to leave gaps or split faults or anything like this. Um, either, as I said, gives the equivalent high order accuracy as in space using a single explicit time integration step and um, increasing order of accuracy can be cheap if it's done in a, in a, in a, in a correct manner. Test meshes can account for complex realities of geological subsurface. Um, we're using here um, a modal formulation. So if you're using ADA DG, you still have a choice of the numerical flux that you're using. And in the exahype training, this will be becoming apparent that the user can choose which flux to use. So here we're using um, a model formulation, and um, it just turns out that this is actually favorable in terms of numerical dissipation, especially for dynamic rupture problems. And um, it's also easy to build this high order arbitrary basis function with, mo with a model formulation and the orthogonal basis function. All right, I have, um, want to quickly talk about the grand challenge of meshing. And um, 
just want to point out that there's currently two community standards that you will also be exposed to during this training. And the first one is uh, hexahedral meshes, um, which is um, complicated or limited for complicated geometries. Um, can use a lot of manual work uh, to come up with nice meshes of uh, complex geometries. But it has um, other advantages, especially in terms of efficiency and in terms of degrees of freedom that you have to solve um, for the same problem size compared to TET meshes. And what we were using here are unstructured TET meshes, which allows automatized meshing. You will use G-mesh in the, in the examples and quite complex uh, boundary conditions. It can be numerically challenging because you would often end up with slipper elements. So these are elements which are having a very bad shape. Um, reducing the time step of, um, of, your, of your model that you're running, uh, making this more expensive than it maybe should be. And the way to circumvent that is to use a method called local time stepping that every element can go at its own time step, but we're using it right there. In the training, you use um, GMesh, so that's an open source measure. Just want to point out that for uh, more complicated methods, we're using um, a tool called SimModeler that is free for academic use. So you will use, uh, you will have an um, example of the Palo Sulawesi earthquake that uh, mesh that is generated with SimModeler. And um, yeah, we're using parallel data formats. <clears throat> I have a slide about the numerics in a nutshell. So, um, we solved the elastic wave equation and velocity stress formulation. So this is um, just here the quantitative relation and the conservation of momentum written out. We have um, formulated that in terms of the linear hyperbolic system, which we solved with an explicit method, <clears throat> a common approach computational seismology. And um, this is just um, a visualization of how the DG operators will look in terms of sparsity. Um, <clears throat> And the DG discrete form written in a short way here. And as I said before, we're combining this higher order time integration with a higher order DG space discretization. We're choosing um, a model flux, what we call basis function, exact treatment solver. <laughs> and um, an important advantage is that the computations are local and only neighboring elements exchange data. And I've written out here also the update scheme that is used um, to get to the next time step. What's interesting here is that this boils down to a lot of small uh, matrix matrix multiplications <clears throat> where the dimensions, or for example, if you think about these patterns here, they would depend on the order of the scheme that is used. And um, in the beginning, when we started with a um, geophysics version of that code, um, we saw that um, this matrix matrix multiplications would consume about 70% uh, percent of the runtime. Um, the geophysics version used Fortran 90, was MPI parallelized and used ASCII based serial input output. Uh, but the version that you will be using and you'll be trained on, you will see it's um, quite different. And this is just a short history of um, how we got there and um, entitled it by balancing high performance computing and geophysics, or like how to advance both of these fields um, in working on a, on a community code together with uh, computational scientists. And, um, Here's just an example that uh, was enabled by computational um, improvements of the code. So this is an example of the Landers earthquake run um, <clears throat> for 200,000 time steps and 16, 96 billion degrees of freedom um, using assembler level DG kernels. So we have a code generator that kind of automatically detects and exploits sparse block patterns and does the hardware aware. So something that's specific for the hardware that is used um, unrolling vectorization of the element operations. And um, in terms of what you see as a user that allowed us to um, not only get 10 times faster time to solution, but also to run 100 times bigger problems in terms of the unknowns that we're able to handle. We've been working um, on that for tackling mega trust earthquakes, so much larger dimensions and also very complicated geometries of subduction zones. And uh, here's an example of a um, Sumatra earthquake scenario. As you can see, um, the decrease of freedom, so the unknown resolving port didn't increase that much, but it's a much, much higher number of time steps that are tackled here. And the main advantage of that is that um, local time stepping was introduced um, based on clusters of elements that run at the same time step, um, which led to another speed of a factor of 14. These zero ones can use full supercomputers. 
um, again, for example, on petaflop scale. However, um, these examples that you will run do not use full supercomputers and also not the whole training cluster, but hopefully half a node. We hope that will work. And also, um, this is just a couple of lists of computational optimization, especially the um, technical university um, is leading at the moment. But um, our typical scenarios are not running um, on that large of models, but it's um, around a, a couple of thousand CPU hours per high resolution forward simulation. And it's not only multi scale, but also multi physics. Here's an example of um, um, a dynamic rupture model of the Landers earthquake. We can also see, see that we're accounting for all damage, um, kind of resampling shear zones here that were not part of the prescribed fault. We've been also doing a lot of work of how to link these kind of complex earthquake scenarios to especially tsunami modeling tools. And I think I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, so I, I go a little bit faster here, but um, we do have um, possibilities and kind of open source workflows to couple the earthquake scenarios that you're running with sites all um, in an easy manner to tsunami models. <clears throat> And um, that has been published in, in GGI. So basically, we're using the dynamic seafloor, seafloor displacement over time, for example, from a, um, a model of the Sumatra earthquake and linked it to uh, a 2D tsunami model, typical shallow water equation solver, <coughs> understanding how tsunamis are generated from earthquakes. I want to introduce um, a model of the 2018 Palo Sulawesi event. This is the third training example that we will cover. Um, for those, yeah, this was um, an interesting earthquake because it propagated at super sheer speed and it also triggered a surprise tsunami since this was a strike slip fault system hosting the earthquake crossing beneath Palo Bay, um, triggering a very devastating event. I think it was the deadliest um, earthquake at least of 2018. And um, <clears throat> we've been working on constructing a, a, a fault system and a mechanical plausible dynamic rupture model that you will use in a, in a lower resolution too. And we've been showing that uh, if you're exposing the strike slip fault system with its geometric complexities to a regional tectonic loading that is, um, can be constrained from simple proxies like the world stress map, um, accounting for that this is a cooler part basin, you can actually see that the rupture dynamics are relatively complicated and can also introduce enough movement underneath Palo Bay to um, sourcing a realistic tsunami. So what you will see when you're looking at the model that you'll be running is that there's a step of around 1.5 meter um, just underneath the bay due to the fault, faulting, um, normal faulting components. <laughs> and this is my last Slide, I think this is an outlook of what we're working on in cheese. Um, this is uh, led by Lukas Krent of TUM. So we are striving to do fully coupled simulations, coupling dynamic rupture, seismic wave propagation with an acoustic um, ocean layer where we have acoustic elastic response with acoustic waves and um, a relatively um, Nice idea of how to include the tsunami propagation also in this model. So the tsunami would be here um, starting to evolve in Palo Bay directly within the site for simulation. And this is using um, a linear tree surface boundary condition, which was uh, shown before to work in 2D. And um, this is part of site in 3D at the moment. And for this, we really need this um, local time stepping approach, as you can see here, um, the elements inside the water layer being very small, just to be accounting for uh, the very different wave speeds that we will have that in that model. Your CISO team for the next stage from LMU, this is Ruby Carsten, Bo, uh, Toma, Duo, Taufik, and Aniko. And um, can also, of course, for the uh, members of the TUM team that should also be able to help. And um, I hope you will have a very nice training focusing precisely specifically on how to model earthquakes together with seismic wave propagation. And I'm happy to take any questions. So many thanks, Alice. Um, is there a quick question?
So either raise your voice or type in the chat. We can also ask questions later because I, I spoke a bit too long. <laughs> so if you want to ask questions later, um, you can use the private chat, for example, here, or maybe yeah. during the coffee break or after coffee break. Yeah. Um, Okay, then the next point on the agenda is a coffee break for half an hour, and I suggest we start sharp at 11 o'clock. And I would also suggest that people don't lock out of Zoom, but uh, keep the Zoom session open. It just uh, is quicker to restart later on. So make sure you turn your microphones off in your video, and we reconvene here at 11 o'clock. Okay, then see you in 25 minutes. Bye. So Navid, um, the example of the crack growth by rupture modeling, that was done with ExaHype. We're using ExaHype there. So in Zysol, we have, um, um, we're accounting for awful damage at the moment using um, continuous, continuum plasticity models. So you would just map um, plastic strain being induced during rupture and that can take very complicated shapes as was shown in the Flanders example, um, where you really see um, shear bands evolving or shear localization mimicking falls. But that would not um, then be like a dynamic rupture interface evolving. In the XIF example that was part of Leo's talk, these shear cracks that are evolving there, they can actually also hold rupture themselves and emit seismic waves. But this is, um, that would be a different, um, a different equation to solve. There's also work in, in the group of Harsha, um, Harsha Bhatt. We're using um, different numerical schemes for getting these explicit accountants for fracture. And um, it depends a little bit on the length scales that you're interested in, if this is useful. So I think for this meso scale, you really have shear branching evolving that is very useful to do explicit, um, to explicitly account for fractures. On the microscopic scale, you have maybe a lot of tensile cracks evolving. Um, a homogenization approach or continuum plasticity approach might be more suitable um, if you're modeling larger earthquakes. Hello, uh, I just have a small question. Hi, this is Srihari. So, Hi. yeah, that was a really good presentation. And yeah, I have gone through your paper on Kaikor earthquake where you have really modeled a uh, very complex fault system. Yeah, so I just have a quick question about how you model, uh, you know, fault system in machine. Like uh, it's really complex intersections and everything. Yes. Um, yeah. So this is a critical point for dynamic rupture modeling because often, if you if you think about splitting the fault interface and you do that for um, a branching point, you would have one node that is kind of belonging to two faults and doesn't know what to do. Yeah. In our case, we, we don't really have to um, do anything special because our faults are defined at the element interfaces and everything that happens is done in the numerical fluxes um, that these two elements exchange anyway all the time. So our branching points are, there's no special treatment of those. This is just because we're not um, looking at this in terms of the nodes, but the, at the nodes of the elements, but in terms of the interfaces. So it's always clearly defined which interface is the fault interface. Um, so there's no ambiguity there. You don't have to do any anything special. And um, we've been part of um, of this benchmarking efforts or code verification efforts. And you can actually see that if you're leaving, for example, a gap in between um, faults, uh, the earthquake dynamics are different because um, to jump over a gap, even if it's just uh, like a 100 meter, 200 meter gap. Uh, works via dynamic triggering, so it have waves transferring the stresses for the earthquake to jump. Um, whereas if it's connected, you have frictional failure driving that, and that is um, leading different, slightly di uh, leading to different results. So uh, one more question is: uh, so when we use tetrahedral mesh, and yeah, we get this weird shape and very super small elements, and our, our time step it really goes down. And mm -hmm. I heard uh, DG. Uh, it takes a lot of time for a lot of computational time for each time step. So, yeah. So what we're doing for um, for accounting for like bad meshes, 
is that we implemented this um, local time stepping scheme. So that really relaxes that problem. Since um, if you would have like a sliver element or badly um, element of a bad aspect ratio leading to a very small time step, it could um, update that independently of maybe the majority of the elements which are um, requiring larger time steps. And it's only communicating once needed with the other clusters different time steps. So that's called it's, it's called local time stepping. Um, and that was if I, when I showed this table that um, for example for a mega trust like a, a scenario like the Sumatra earthquake where you would have these very complex geometries, especially with the mega trust um, merging with the interface at a very shallow angle. Um, that is why we had this the main reason why we had the speed up of factor 14 there. Because um, yeah. This is not that this is not causing the whole code to be slow. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking your time. No, no, I'm here to talk about this. So. If there's no urgent questions, I will also get a copy. <laughs> oh, there's a question. No. Continue with the next session. Actually, I would suggest to take a, a group picture, the conference picture. And for that, I would suggest that everybody actually, well, everybody who wants um, opens their video, the camera. Well, okay. So that's, Take a couple of screenshots here from my screen. Okay, so I got a couple of pictures. Thanks everyone. Uh, we will share them later. And uh, we're going to continue now with the introduction to SpecPrem 3D and Salvos. Who's going to present for SpecPrem 3D? Yes, uh, I will present uh, for SpecPrem 3D. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, I will share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your window, yes. Okay, 
just so I just want to to give you an overview of the Spectrum 3D code. Did you, did you just switch to full screen? We don't see the full screen. We're just seeing. Uh, the yes, I switched for, to full screen. Do you see the full screen? No, we still see the editor. The, the editor. Uh, whatever this is, um, PowerPoint or. That's um, full screen mode. And uh, now, no, you don't see the. No. Mm -hmm, I don't know what the pen. I will. I will try again to share. This, this is a full screen now. Uh, just a moment. It's coming up. Yeah. Yes, it's full screen. Yes. Okay. So uh, I just want to give you an overview of the SpecFem code. This is a spectral finite element method for seismic wave propagation in 3D complex models. Um, the SpecFem code was initially developed early in 2000 um, for the global scale simulation. Um, it should take into account the complexity of the Earth, uh, like topography, ellipticity, internal discontinuities, uh, crust thickness, and heterogeneities inside the, the Earth. Uh, the goal is, was to make the much as possible to precise, accurate simulation on a global scale. Here you can see a movie uh, of Sumatra earthquake in uh, 2004. Uh, you, you can see the, in, in the top figure here the, the uh, rupture of the, uh, along the fault and the wave that triggered in the, the rupture and the, uh, in the top, in the bottom movie, the, the global scale propagation. So after the, um, this first version of SpecFem, uh, the SpecFem was extended to, um, to regional scale to focus on the region that extend over 100 kilometers. Um, to study more precisely uh, small geological structures. You can see here a, a mesh uh, that represents uh, some body inside the there, some ge geological structures, and uh, the movie uh, that shows the simulation inside this, um, uh, this model. Actually, it's a model in northern Italy. Uh, I think it's uh, L'Aquila earthquakes. So the application domain of SpecFem is, of course, seismology. And more recently, uh, we begin to use SpecFem in different uh, uh, area, like ocean acoustics and non-destructive testing. I just want to show you an example of ocean acoustics. Um, the setup is, is uh, quite simple. You have a water layer and a sediment layer. And uh, the goal is to study the interaction uh, of the wave in this fluid solid uh, interfaces. Uh, it's challenging on computational point of view because um, in water layer the attenuation is very low. That means uh, even high frequency propagate very far from the, the source. So to do a um, reliable simulation we need to propagate a lot of uh, wavelengths. That means we need to use a very big uh, mesh and that leads to have very big simulations. So you can see here an example of simulation in this 2D cross section uh, with seamounts okay, uh, that are in um, ocean. And you can see there are a very complex interaction between the waves and uh, these seamounts. Um, we validated this um, the setup for ocean acoustics against uh, real data that we um, we have. Uh, measured in experimental tanks uh, in, in our lab uh, to validate the setup for ocean acoustics for the SpecFem code. The, in the next um, area application of SpecFem is the non-destructive testing of materials. The, the setup uh, is the following. The a transductor triggers the shear waves that uh, propagate inside the uh, the material, like a concrete, for example, here, the, the way it interacts with um, with all the heterogeneity inside the the material, 
And uh, you can see here in the movie that it leads to have a very complex wave field with a very complex coda. And by studying this coda, uh, we can say uh, something on, on material, if the material damage or not. This is very useful for uh, for inspecting building, for example, or, or um, bridge. So this, this method uh, rely on spectral element method. This method was uh, initially developed for computational field dynamics uh, by Patera in um, 1984. This method has two advantages, uh, the, the accuracy of, spectral, of sub, pseudo spectral method and the flexibility of finite element method. We can mesh uh, complex uh, models, complex geometry with uh, uh, large uh, curved um, hexahedral elements. And inside each hexahedral element, we are using I-degree polynomial interpolation to have a, uh, a good accuracy. This mesh can honor the main discontinuities and the topography. And what is important is the this method um, it leads to have a diagonal mass matrix. That means we have no linear system to invert. It is, it is, it is very interesting for on parallel computer uh, because it's easier to, to, to design a, a, a very uh, uh, <coughs> uh, efficient parallel, parallel code with this kind of, of method. So this method was extended by Comatich and Trump and Chaljud Capdeville to the uh, seismology. So the wave equation uh, that we solve is the following. It's a question of motion. It's uh, the, the second order um, equation. We, we, we have here the U is a displacement, the second time derivative of displacement, the acceleration multiplied by the mass, mass matrix equal to the force. We have two terms, the divergence of the stress tensor and the, the term F with a source term. It can be an earthquake, a moment tensor, a force, or uh, a transductor that, that triggers the uh, acoustic wave field. And we solve this um, equation with a, in weak form that we just need to multiply the, uh, each term of the equation by a trial function here at W and take the integral over the domain. Uh, we do an integration by part of the, the term uh, that involves the divergence in order to make appear uh, surface term. Inside the surface term, we have the traction. And this is uh, important for seismology because at the free surface, the tra traction vanished. We just need to remove this term of the, of the equation to handle uh, very easily uh, free surface. So even for complex topography, uh, we not, do not need to, to do additional uh, uh, computation. For uh, We just need to remove the ter the, this term and we have a very accurate uh, representation of the free surface. And of course, we can add a memory variable for attenuation and take it to account ocean load at a global scale. So uh, the element that we are using, it's uh, Exhydra. It's map, these elements are mapped to the unit cube. And we have can use two kinds of elements with a different uh, point node control. Uh, we can use only eight uh, point control, like uh, at the left. Or if we need to, um, to fit more complex geometries, we can bend the, the element in order to, to fit this uh, the geometry, the topography, or tendal discontinuities by adding additional point control in order to bend the, the edges and the faces of the element. Uh, it is easier to, to, to mesh uh, some kind of geometry with this uh, kind of element. So inside each element, um, we define a discretization um, using uh, Lagrange polynomials. Uh, in order to represent the functions, the, the wave field inside the element, the, the material properties. Usually, we are using degree 4 to 7 for uh, elements. And this, uh, 
using these Lagrange polynomials leads us to have a strictly diagonal matrix uh, inside uh, each element and thus no linear system to invert and thus we are using a, a fully explicit time scheme uh, for solving the wave equation. So I want to show you a mesh that was defined at a global scale. You can see that uh, the mesh, the size of the, each element uh, depends on the position of element in the mesh. So it's adapted to the pro material properties. Uh, in the case of, of the Earth, uh, the velocity at the surface are lower than the velocity in depth. And basically, the size of the mesh of the element depends on the, on the, the velocity. If, if the velocity is, is low, we need to, 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 to mesh with a small element. If the velocity is high, we can use a bigger element to have the same accuracy. So for the global scale mesh, uh, this is an internal measure uh, in spectrum. We don't need to, to use an external measure. It's automatic mesh. Uh, and it automatically um, uh, mesh with the material properties. So uh, you can see that there are some layers, there are some doubling bricks. When the, the main discontinuity of the Earth, we can uh, uh, use bigger element and so on uh, in depth. So this mesh was adapted for the first version of SpecFem at the global scale, but if we want to, to mesh other objects, other uh, structures. Uh, we need to switch uh, on different mesh depending on what we want to mesh. If you want to mesh uh, a model to continental scale, the internal mesh of SpecFem uh, is, uh, is suitable. We just need to, 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 to take a piece of the, of the, of the, the, the global mesh. Um, for the, here, an example of volcano, we need to mesh more complex geometry, more complex topography. We can use uh, an external measure like qubit or trellis, even gmesh uh, works. And here I show you an example of asteroid. This is, was meshed with uh, trellis and uh, a coffee mug also with trellis. We, we cannot mesh this with uh, internal mesh. Uh, but SpecFem uh, have a uh, support to read different formats uh, coming from different mesh. So, um, SpecFem was designed to, to do high-performance computing. The uh, cluster, an high-performance cluster, that can be seen as a, a lot of small computers that are connected by a network, a node, uh, a core. So, um, the strategy to, uh, to, to use this uh, computational power was to um, Use an MPI implementation by domain decomposition. So we split the mesh in small pieces and we assign each piece to this mesh slice to one core on one, uh, one node. So to, to do with, we are doing that because if we have a very big mesh, uh, this mesh cannot fit the memory of only one core on only one node. If you split the mesh by two, uh, you need to, uh, it's require less uh, memory. And so on, if you split the mesh by four, by five, and we expect that by splitting the mesh, um, by this we scale with the number of processors. Um, so, but when we split the mesh, we need to communicate between the processor. Uh, for example, if we have a source uh, that is uh, situated in the white region here, the wave propagate inside the white region, and when the wave reach the boundary of this white region, the, the wave uh, need to be through this region to, to, to reach the red region. In, in this case, we need to communicate the solution, the boundary of the white region to the, to the red region. So at each time step, uh, we communicate the solution of the boundary of each MPI slices to uh, the neighbors. And uh, it can take a time. So we have a strategy of non-blocking API communication uh, in order to overlap the communication by, uh, by computation. Uh, non-blocking API communication, that means uh, the communication are done at the same time that the, the computation. 
So we don't we don't need to stop the com computation at each time step and communicate and, and resume the, the, the computation. We, we can do the, the, the both. Uh, at the same time, we can we can uh, we can do the, the two the two things, and that lead to uh, improve the scaling of, uh, of the code. Uh, I show you uh, the biggest simulation we did uh, was did with Petsuboy at all in 2016 with SpecFem. It's on K computer in Japan. He used uh, he did the simulation at a global scale for a period of 1.2 seconds. He used uh, around uh, 80 uh, thousand nodes. It represents um, 600,000 cores. So the setup was the following: he used uh, 80 80,000. MPI process and the eight MPI thread per MP, open MPI thread per MPI process. The mesh was very big, uh, about 10 billion elements, 1.8 trillion degree of freedom, and he performed some um, scaling test. For strong scaling, he did only two tests because uh, the mesh is so big, we can, cannot. Uh, used uh, less uh, than uh, for um, 400 uh, uh, nodes, and you can see uh, we can see that the the, the, the points are close to the ideal uh, scaling for the strong scaling, and also for weak scaling. Or for weak scaling, uh, you can use less. Uh, nodes because in weak scaling you we increase the size of the computation with the same time that the size the, the number of nodes. So and after the second code also have a support for GPU computing. Uh, we are using GPU because it uh, leads to have a very large speed up compared to the CPUs. Uh, this support was done uh, ten years ago. And the strategy is the same as uh, the, 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 the CPU. We split the mesh uh, with, uh, and distribute with MPI. Um, in GPU, the, the code is uh, in CUDA. And we need to communicate between the graphic card uh, with MPI exactly uh, like the, the CPU code. And this. Uh, Leads to have a very good uh, scaling uh, behavior. You can see here um, the weak scaling obtained in 10 years ago when, when the spec frame was reported on GPUs. It's a, it's a weak scaling, and, and you can see it, it's close to perfect. It's uh, uh, up to 192 uh, GPUs. Uh, why we are want to, to use big computer and um, a very fast computation. It's it can be useful for the seismic tomography uh, to study the the, the subsurface, the earth sub subsurface. Uh, the goal is to image the geological structures that are inside the earth by using um, records of seismic waves at the free surface. Here is an example in Southern California, with some earthquake occurred in, in this region with. Uh, uh, triangular stations, uh, the beach ball area, the position of earthquake. And the goal is to simulate uh, in the initial guess model uh, each earthquake. So it, here is, there is about 100 earthquakes that represent 100 simulation to, uh, to compare the data and the synthetics. You can see in this picture the, the synthetics in red and the data in, uh, in black. And you can see that only the, the one, uh, the first arrival can fit the, the data. And by do some perturbation of the model, we can improve this fit. Uh, for example, in, in the, the middle column here, uh, it's uh, synthetics computed in this model. You can see uh, the fit is better than the previous one. And Iteration by iteration, we can improve the model, change the model to improve the fit. 
and you can see the final model here that explain the, the data, the, all the, the phases in the, the data we have. Um, this uh, was done with um, a squake inside the, the regional box, but we also can do uh, the same study with uh, teleseismic events. The teleseismic events are earthquakes that occur uh, a few thousand kilometers far from, from the network. This is an example of Pyrenees in South France, North Spain. Um, we did a teleseismic tomography. Uh, using uh, especially this this line of station here, and you can see the model uh, obtained by uh, using five uh, teleseismic events just uh, below the, uh, this uh, this network and the geological interpretation here. And so, some at the global scale, some hydrogen tomography was performed uh, to study the and to improve the, the knowledge of the structure that we have inside uh, the Earth. We can see the, some result. The, the picture represents uh, the, the color scale, represents the variation of the material properties inside the Earth. And the, 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 the principle is the same. We, there are earthquakes and stations, and we need to fit the, the data by synthetics and update the model to in order to fit as much as possible, better pos as possible, the, the, the synthetics. So, um, the SpecFem 3D software package, it's an open source code. Uh, you can find it in uh, GitHub, in this link. The goal is to model acoustic, elastic, viscoelastic, also power elastic, seismic wave propagation, in motion acoustics, in Earth, in also for non destructive testing. Uh, it was developed by a lot of, of uh, contributors, initially by Dimitri Komatic and Jean-Pierre Villot in IPGP in Paris, and after uh, by Jerome, also by Jerome Trump in Harvard and Caltech. Uh, there are a lot of, of contributors. Each, actually, each user can submit a contribution on SpecFem using the GitHub by just submit a pull request, and uh, the, the main developer will, will take into consideration each uh, each pull request or uh, you can also um, use the github to submit an issue uh, or if you, you want to if you have an idea of development we will take into uh, consideration so um, to, uh, tomorrow we will see in the training how to, to use uh, the basic uh, functionality of specfem to, to set up a mesh to to, do, uh, to perform a modeling in the homogeneous model, and uh, at the end we will see how to compute a sensitivity kernel in order to, to set up uh, seismic tomography. Uh, so that, that's it. I thank you for your attention. If you have questions. Okay, thank you very much, Vadim. Um, so please, questions if there are any. Yes, I have a question about memory variable. Uh, yes, it's related to viscoelasticity. Uh, we are using a standard linear solid representation uh, for viscoelasticity, for a constant uh, quality factor. And since we are in time domain, um, we need to do a convolution by uh, all the past. And this can be very... Uh, difficult to, to, to make it uh, uh, efficient on the computers. So uh, the trick is to use the memory variable. It's, it's additional um, um, differential equation that, that represents this uh, state of load of material. Uh, and um, the dissipation is modelized by additional um, uh, ODE, ODE uh, differential equation that can uh, that is solved in a time step. We don't need to convolve about the entire past. Uh, entire past. It, it's very it's more efficient in uh, from a computational point of view. Okay. Any other questions?
you can also just raise your voice and ask directly. Uh, hi, I have a question. Yeah. I cannot hear you. It's very difficult to hear you. You're very low, the voice. Uh, hello. Is it better? Not uh, much. Like... Just try. <laughs> okay, I'll just type it. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Maybe in the meantime, I can ask my question. Uh, I heard sometimes that um, wave propagation maybe is not very well suited for GPUs because you cannot save a lot of memory during the simulation, but uh, you mentioned that you use it. So I, I never seen simulations using GPU, that's why I ask. Yes, but actually the, the implementation um, uh, on GPU on SpecFem is very efficient. Uh, personally, I, I'm no use CPU anymore. I'm uh, even uh, every time doing uh, computation on GPU because we have on the modern graphic card we have a speed up about about 100 compared to the to the, to the CPU. It's um, for the spectral element method. The implementation did actually it was did by NVIDIA. The implementation uh, it's very efficient and. Um, Maybe uh, for other methods like finite differences, it's more complicated to, more complex to port in porting in in, in in GPUs. But uh, in this uh, case, it's very efficient. Actually, we we are um, launching all the the elements at the same time on the graphic card, and one thread per uh, degree of freedom. Uh, so that is very efficient, actually. I think there's more um, questions in the chat. Uh, Uh, yes, it's about the frequency band used for away from fit in in world. So, um, in Southern California, the frequency band was uh, about um, I think uh, three seconds, three five seconds. Uh, for the um, the Pyrenees example, the the frequency band the period the, the minimum period was five seconds. So to to twenty seconds to five seconds, and at global scale, the um, the medium period is seventeen seconds for 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 this model. It at global scale, it required to compute on biggest big be very big com computer. It's a submit in uh, in US. It's a GPU computer in, in US. The big bigger biggest GPU computer actually. So if there's uh, no other questions, then I would suggest to continue with the last comment. Salvos. Who's going to present for Salvos? Hi, Jose. I'm here now. Um, okay. Please go ahead. Can you now see my screen? You can see your PowerPoint window. And now full screen. Just full screen? Great. Yes. One second. I'm just, just curious. Can you see this annotation? Is this working, for instance? Yes, it is. OK, cool. Maybe I'll use that. It's very thin, so you might change your width of that. But yeah. you can see it. I'll just circle stuff, so I think it's fine. OK. so. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks for uh, sticking around for, for the Salvus introduction. Um, so what I'll do now is essentially go through a quick overview of, of the types of problems that, that Salvus is, is designed to solve. 
And I think you'll find some similarities and, and differences compared to the codes that were, uh, that were um, have been previously presented. Um, and maybe there, there's something here that, uh, that, that, that strikes your interest. After this, I'll kind of go through the, the different components that, that, that make up Salvis um, and, and what type of problems we're, we're really trying to solve in, on the practical level. Then I'll go through some cool applications and use cases of, of some current users that have, that have been uh, quite exciting. I'll give a quick introduction to, to Mondaic. You might notice that there's a kind of a logo and a DH spinoff logo at the bottom here. I'll explain what's going on there. And then finally, just a quick teaser for uh, the tutorial on Friday um, where we'll look at a, a full waveform inverse problem. So a quick overview, what is Salvis? Um, as we've seen so far, we are looking at wave propagation problems on, on many different scales. Um, we of course have wave propagation uh, problems of interest on small regional scale examples. On the left here, you can see an animation of a, of a wave propagation through the Monterey Bay area for the purposes of, of DAS um, acoustic monitoring. And on the other hand, we, we, we heard about Mars from, from Elise, and, and we know that there's a seismometer on the inside probe, which is being used to probe the interior of, of, of the planet. So although we're both looking at kind of geophysical scales here, we're already seeing you know, a vast difference in, in scale and application from a local scale example to an entire astrophysical body. But of course, as the Dean mentioned, um, geophysical seismology is of course kind of just the first frontier of, of wave propagation and, and, and analyzing these, these results. Currently, there's a lot of interesting work that's going on in borehole acoustics to, for instance, ensure that um, the, the drilling becomes safer for, for geothermal and oil and gas exploration. And of course, the classic example of using seismic waves to uh, extract information about the earth obviously comes from exploration geophysics where, where, um, where energy deposits in reserve, where it's used to look for, for energy deposits in reserve. But of course, these days, again, as, as the Dean mentioned, we're going even beyond here. Um, for instance, there, there's a lot of new applications over the past decade or so in, in medical imaging and actually trying to use um, ultrasound waves to, to create high resolution 3D images of the interior of the human body for, for cancer detection. And something even newer than this is, is likely non-destructive testing. So kind of on the right here, you see the scattered wave field resulting from a small thickness variation in a, uh, in, a, in a pipe, for instance. And the idea here is to, to look at the difference in the scattered wave field and use that to reconstruct um, where the thickness variation might be and, uh, and react accordingly in, in a real world situation. So kind of a, as we've seen with these applications and also everything that's been presented, you know, the, the, the problems which are relevant for wave propagation is, is almost anything you can think of. Um, and these range from problems in 2D where uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, for instance, slices through the human body to 3D, where we're looking at the huge global scale simulations that, that Vadim was talking about. Um, of course, the physics that we have to uh, consider also increase in complexity from the early days of, of wave propagation. Um, about 20 years ago in, in seismic exploration, the acoustic approximation was, was, was king. In fact, it, it mostly still is. But I think there's, there's many applications that we know about where elastic, viscoelastic physics, and in particular, coupled physics between, between the ocean and the subsurface are becoming exceedingly important. The domains that we're working on increase in complexity as well. Um, on, on, you know, simple Cartesian domains are great for setting up you know, uh, scientific problems and investigating the convergence of different solution types or, or looking at inverse methods. But when we want to apply these problems to real world examples, you know, the, the earth is just never a cube or a, or, um, or a rectangle. So we really need to go beyond and figure out a way to, to represent our domain in a completely unstructured manner. And then finally, the, the cost, the computational cost of these simulations ranges by orders of magnitude um, from say small problems you can run in a second on your laptop to the largest uh, PDE constrained optimization problems in the world that run on the largest computers in the world. Um, so this is really the, the domain that, that, that all of us kind of as, as geophysicists interested in wave propagation are, are, are dealing with. And it's to basically kind of encapsulate the, the problems on, on these different domains that, that Salvos was designed. So in a nutshell, it, it's really a high performance software package designed for scientific wave propagation problems. And with a specific focus on performance, reproducibility and ease of use. And I'll kind of get into this more a bit later. Um, 
Vadim gave an excellent introduction to the spectral element method, which also forms the heart of salvus. Um, and um, what, uh, what we're interested in doing is, is taking that method um, and looking at the problems where it's well suited to, to solve to actually really make reproducible science uh, easy. Okay, so that's kind of a, a general overview of the, the different components we're looking at. So um, now I wanna give a, a breakdown of the different core components of Salvus. So you'll, you'll see that there's five in total and we'll interact with all of these over the course of the um, tutorial on Friday. So Salvus is broken down into distinct packages, um, Salvus Compute, Salvus Mesh, Flow, Opt, and Project. And they're all relatively orthogonal in, in the problems that they solve. And I'll go through them one by one and just give a quick overview of each, of each, of each thing. So first of all, Salvus Compute. So the idea to create a, a new uh, spectral element uh, waveform solver was initially inspired by the Collaborative Seismic Earth Model Project, which is a, a scientific project aimed at multi-scale imaging of, of, of the Earth, um, where it was basically realized that um, what, what one of the core components that was missing was a solver which, was, which could work uh, easily on regional scales and also on global scales that maintained the same interface throughout, the same model representation, the same meshing techniques, just so that we could easily kind of translate information across these scales um, you know, in a, in a, in a non-tedious fashion. So this kind of got us thinking about you know, how, how would we actually do this if, if we were able to start from scratch. And of course, I think we heard the quote that the, the forward problem is, is solved earlier. I, it's, I'm not sure if that, that's true in general, but I think there's a couple specific cases where, where the spectral element method um, performs very well um, for, for geophysical wave propagation problems. And because of this, uh, we did choose it for, for, um, for our application. And like Spectrum 3D, um, we use a continuous Galerican spectral element discretization in space. Um, where we kind of differ a bit is, is our, in our um, uh, handling of, of different dimensions and geometry. So Salvus is designed from scratch to work on both two and three dimensions with, with the same interface. Um, and I'll explain how this happens in the, in the meshing slide too. And of course, um, the problems that we solve compared to say exahyper are very specific. We wanna solve you know, wave propagation problems in fluid, solid, or coupled viscoelastic domains. So we basically focus on this, chose our discretization and went ahead and, and wrote the solver. Um, hmm, I see the animations are a bit messed up, but um, so to handle the different um, uh, dimensions and different uh, abstractions of the domain that I was talking about, um, we really rely heavily on the DMplex package within Petsy. So if you're not familiar with this, um, work, work on this was, was part of the, um, was part of what we did during the cheese project. And this is work done by Vaslav Hapla and Matt Nepley. And what this allows us to do is very efficiently read uh, a general unstructured mesh in parallel on, on the largest machines in the world. And this was a huge advance for, for doing large scale simulations um, when you really do not know what the domain um, or the domain does not have any interesting structure from the beginning. Um, forgive the overlapping images, but um, I'll just have everything on screen right now. Um, so the, the scalability of, of Salos kind of mirrors that of, of other implementations of the spectral element method. Um, the, the method is, is easily parallelizable due to, as Vadim mentioned, the diagonal mass matrix. Um, so this allows us to, to really scale without any particular effort from laptops to the largest super, supercomputers. And then finally, just the, the core languages that we're using here are C++ for the CPU implementation and CUDA for the GPU implementation. And um, as we heard already, the, the GPU support does give us a significant speed boost over, over CPUs um, for, for similar region, for similar reasons. Um, in a couple of these slides, I'll, I'll have um, uh, references down at the bottom there. If you want to know more information about the specific implementations or just general uh, concepts that we're looking at, um, I, I believe this is, is being recorded. So um, feel free to, to, to page back through that. Or if not, if you miss something, just, just ask me and I'll, and I'll pass you the proper reference. Okay, so now with the development of, of a new solver, we of course ran into the next problem that has been brought up before. And it's the fact that meshing is difficult. Um, specifically meshing for geophysical problems is difficult because we have spec specificities that just really aren't present in say engineering 
um, finite element mesh generation codes. And, and that can kind of be um, uh, summarized as the fact that we have 3D velocity models and we want to adapt our element size to the local velocity. And also we have topography that isn't well represented by say a CAD model. So these two things make it, it sometimes quite tedious to use external third-party meshing packages to, to generate simulation meshes. So the kind of Salvus mesh package was, was built from scratch to kind of automatically handle um, uh, uh, meshes for wave propagation problems in geophysics, um, including variable velocity models and, and different element sizes, and the inclusion of say, say automatic real earth topography. I, I define my domain, the topography gets downloaded and applied, and my mesh gets generated. Um, as uh, the spectral element method requires, of course, the, 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 the constraint here is that we need a conforming quad um, or hexahedral elements. And this is due to the efficiency gain that we get on, on such elements. And of course, the fact that then we don't have to solve any auxiliary problems to communicate the solutions between different element types or across boundaries. Now, with the mesh design, we, we, we focusing further on wave propagation, we, we kind of started to realize that there's a lot of interesting stuff that we can do relatively simply just by uh, manipulating the mesh in certain ways. And among these things are basically designing the mesh to, for the actual solution that you want to, to solve. For instance, on screen here, you can see two examples. One is of a, a global chunk uh, wave propagating on a, a chunk of the globe where the mesh was basically masked. So only locations where we actually record data are simulated and we throw the rest away. And on the right, you see a mesh which is designed to respect the difference in azimuthal and radial complexity of the wave field. Um, this is a, a, a technique which is also used in, in, in other um, spectral element based uh, codes such as um, AxiSem or AxiSem 3D. Uh, our implementation relies on a spectral element discretization and kind of pushes that complexity to the actual meshing side. And the idea for both these things here is that we want to reduce the compute costs for large scale 3D simulations by something like an order of magnitude. Um, and and this, is a, this is why we put the effort in here. And then finally, um, the difference in scale here and the difference in physics uh, really re requires us to, to consider kind of two different types of domains. Um, small domains such as the, um, uh, that in, in Monterey Bay, as you can see right here, where you know, you're on the order of a, maybe 100 kilometers or so, and you really need high resolution topography because you're looking at high frequency simulations. And then also on the global scale, um, where you're still interested in things like you know, the, the effect of the oceans on the 3D seismic wave field, but you just can't afford to store the you know, topography at 10 meter scale for the entire globe. So there's kind of two different, um, uh, two different approaches here. In the tutorial, we'll, we'll focus on the, on the latter, the global scale one, but if you're interested on the, on the local scale as well, um, we, can, we can discuss it later. Okay, so at this point, we were happy enough. We had a, a wave propagation solver and a, uh, and a mesher, which, which worked well for our problems. But then we actually, I think, ran into one of the biggest problems that, that we all face as computational scientists doing large scale simulations. And that's basically, uh, actually running these things and, and, and handling errors and making sure that we don't basically waste a lot of time waiting in the queue submitting simulations that, that might not work at all. So this is kind of where, where Salvus Flow comes in. And what this is, it's a Python-based interface which allows the user to essentially abstract away the compute resource. So what you're seeing on the screen here, and this is where I'll try the annotation, is kind of three modes of, of operation that we, we like to support with Salvus and through Salvus flow. So the first of all, the first one is kind of the local mode of operation. And this is say, you know, if you're doing method development, you really want everything local on your computer. You don't want to deal with the queue. Um, you just want to set up an inverse problem and, and, and try, out your, try out your method. Um, so this is kind of the, the local operation of, of flow. But of course, when we want to scale up to 3D simulations, we'll need some sort of compute resource. And what Salvus Flow does in this case is basically handle the file transfer, handle the, the input file passing to the remote machine, uh, waits in the queue for your simulation to finish, and then, and then downloads the data back to your local machine for analysis. And then finally, the, the mode that we'll work on in the tutorial is actually you can run everything um, up on the HPC machine itself. And basically, your laptop or your, your personal workstation is just a window into, uh, into the, 
into the actual scientific data. Right, so the, the, the way of interacting with Solvus is essentially now through Solvus flow. Um, Solvus is of course a, a C++ based code and it takes a command line, it, it takes an input file as, as I'm sure all other software does. Um, but to kind of encapsulate this, um, Solvus flow is kind of the, the Python based interface to the actual high performance solver itself. And this means that the, the way of interaction is, is essentially through Python scripts or Jupyter notebooks. Um, with all the kind of perks of visualization that, that these bring. And for example, on the right here, you'll see something that we'll do on, on Friday, for instance, how to add a, a source or a receiver to a, a simulation object. So this is, these are all just Python objects, which essentially get turned into the input file um, upon simulation submission. So it makes it harder to make mistakes. And the, of course, one of the biggest issues that, that I think I faced when I was in my uh, doing my PhD was of course submitting an input file which was which was invalid. For instance, I just made up this example here where I wanted to do a simulation and save uh, the strain and displacement fields along a, a surface, um, but of course I misspelled strain. Um, and now sometimes you, this this might start up a simulation and then all of a sudden after you've waiting been waiting in the queue for an hour, uh, all of a sudden it fails and says I, I don't recognize the field strand. Um, but uh, kind of with Salvus flow, we, we really try and catch these things early to make sure that the jobs that get submitted are guaranteed to at least have valid input files. And if they're not, you get a very clear error message as, as to why not. Um, and then finally, yeah, just, just to kind of bring back to the point that we, we saw is that the, the, the whole kind of aspect of, of, of dealing with supercomputers and dealing with cloud resources is just a difficult problem. Um, and I think in general, there, there's not really a good solution to, that works in all cases. Um, we think that, that kind of the development that went into Salvus Flow really helps out with the, our specific case of wave propagation. And uh, we hope to demonstrate this to you on, on Friday. All right, so with these kind of you know, issues addressed um, and, and kind of solutions under development, and we kind of got to what we really wanted to do here. And, and I think is, is a, is a large part of the interest in wave propagation and geophysics and beyond. And that's actually using the waves to, to create an image of, of the target medium, wh whether that be the earth or whether that be new areas such as, as non-destructive testing and then and pipeline monitoring. So this is where Salus Opt comes in. It's also a, a simple Python based interface um, that really focuses on um, uh, the, the use of second order uh, derivative information computed during the simulations to uh, increase convergence to a, to a, um, to a robust and, and, and physical model. This comes with it a, a bunch of interesting problems that, that you can read about in the, in the paper below. And one of those that's specifically relevant to us in geophysics is, is how do we actually regularize our inverse problems on these you know, vast family of grids that we can do simulations on. So the solution here is actually via the simulation of a, of a separate equation, the diffusion equation, which allows us to, uh, to really do some interesting regularization tricks such as anisotropic smoothing, i.e. Um, we know that we will resolve the radial direction better in, in global scale simulations than the azimuthal, um, and also work in regions with strong topography um, while ensuring that we don't um, uh, put artifacts into our actual updated images. Oops. Right, and, and then finally, um, this kind of, this, this whole thing is, is, um, is something that we will look further into on, on Friday. Okay, and then finally, we, we come to solve this project. And this is a relatively new um, uh, project for us. And, and, and we think it, it kind of answers a very specific question about, about reproducibility. Um, for those of you who, who are familiar with waveform inversions, you know that you know, these things often take you know, many years and um, it's, it's very difficult to be able to reproduce the results once, once they've been done. It's just a, a factor of the complexity of the entire problem. And Salvas project is an attempt by us to, to try and make this easier for, for the scientific community and, and users of Salvas. So essentially the goal is this. I mean, I am an earth scientist and I want to create a 3D model of the earth using waveform inversion. So basically I want this picture on the bottom here. So easy, right? Um, I, I, I download some, some seismic observations. I compare them to my synthetic data. I update the model. I do this recursively and, uh, and then I'm done. Well, in reality, the, the 
the situation is far more complicated. Um, I mean, there, there is no standardized way of, of, first of all, interacting with compute systems as we've already seen, but even interacting with data centers, um, uh, per, uh, choosing the right type of misfit, choosing the right type of inverse method, um, and, and basically all the inherent complexities that come with, with doing these simulations and inversions on, on different scales. And kind of add this to the fact that there's often on the order of you know, 10 to 100 iterations and that each of these steps takes place on a different machine. Um, we start to really see the need for some sort of kind of standard solution on, on how to make this reproducible, on how to keep data in, in its right spot and, and, and on how to, how to move forward efficiently. So this is where Salva's project comes in. And this will be the main focus of, of, of Friday and kind of show you and, um, um, a, an interesting or our approach to, to solving this problem. Um, on, a, on a real, real example. So those are the kind of five core packages of Salvis. Um, each one, I think, solves a specific scientific need. Um, although I, I think that it might be clear that compared to the, the other codes here, we, we really focused a lot on kind of the engineering aspect of actually making these things practical and reproducible for scientists. Um, taking as a given that, that we have a, you know, a good implementation of a, of a forward method and then trying to use that to really get interesting results um, from things like full waveform inversion. So just a quick overview of some interesting applications that, that, that um, we've kind of been involved with over the last few years. Of course, there's always the most interesting part of, of work like this is, is to see kind of other scientists pick, uh, pick some stuff up and, and get some real research done. I just wanna highlight four, four, four new use cases. So first of all, uh, Dirk Philip van Hervarden, um, he's using Salus to kind of uh, look at uh, new ways of accelerating uh, full waveform inversion at the continental and global scale by, uh, by using a very efficient method of picking the correct event to use in a given iteration. Um, you can see some images on the screen here and, and he or I would be happy to continue talking about it later. But essentially the idea is that we wanna reduce the number of forward and adjoint simulations in a full waveform inversion on the global scale um, and to do this, we can be smarter about exactly how we pick the data. So there, there's two papers that he's published on this and it's really nice work that's coming along well. And um, it's, uh, it's saving a significant amount of, of compute resources and also um, resulting in less artifacts in the final images. Um, next up, we have Sylvie Thrasterson, um, who is kind of building upon this work, taking the mini batches as a starting point, but using the solution and data adaptive meshes that we discussed earlier and pulling these things together in a custom workflow to really reduce the cost of each individual simulation. So whereas DP was looking at reducing the number of simulations, Sylvie's primarily focused on reducing the cost of individual simulations. Um, and you can see some interesting results that he's been getting here. And I think that what, what's most spectacular about this is that using his and DP's methods, um, you can really, they started from a 1D uh, prem background model and have, have uh, through a, a automated full waveform inversion workflow, have really recovered some spectacular details about, um, about the earth. Now this is still a work in progress. Um, may, some of you may have seen Solvi present at some recent conferences, but um, this, is, this is very, very cool stuff. Kind of over to a different application. So uh, a colleague of ours, Laura Cobden, um, is working on investigating the uh, effect of uh, mantle plumes on high frequency seismic signals. To kind of better map um, where uh, where certain signals and seismic waves may come from. So these require very large simulations at high frequencies. Um, and the idea is to take a geodynamic plume model, um, kind of turn this into an, a viscoelastic model through uh, material relationships, and then do yes, wave. Are, maybe it's because you're running um, animation on the slides. Oh, sorry. Was that kind of blowing up the connection? Can anyone hear me? Yes, and for me it was fine all the time. So. Ah, okay. Um, right. Just just to kind of to just to follow up on Laura, she's doing some some really interesting work here, and I'm sure she'd love uh, she'd love uh, any questions if you have them. And then finally, uh, in the medical imaging field, this is work done by a master's student, Patrick Marty, who's really trying to use Salus to answer some, some questions about how far we can go with uh, medical imaging for, say, uh, brain, uh, looking at the early brain cancer detection. 
And so he's looking at different uh, modes of forward propagation physics, whether we can do this acoustically or elastically. And I think you can see from the bottom here, getting some very, very spectacular results on actually kind of doing a full waveform inversion for soft tissue in the human body. I mean, and this is again, ongoing work, which is, which is just getting started. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the you know, range of applications that, that we're interested in, in, in looking at and, and, and working on. And then, so finally, I of course wanna address what, what Bondaic is um, and, and why, why we say spinoff here. So basically, Salvis was originally conceived and developed by its developers time at ETH um, over, over the past couple, couple of years. And kind of as, as a mode for, for trying to fund this moving forward, in 2018, we founded an official ETH spinoff that basically focused on maintaining Salvis for, for different communities and also looking for kind of new growth opportunities and, and, and pushing into these new application domains that we mentioned. Um, and this kind of does come with of course, a lot of uh, additional overhead that's you know, generally not uh, in, in an academic code. And this is essentially a lot of the time that we spend is kind of engineering the back end and ensuring that you know, all that the, the, the tests pass, that all their tutorials still work as we upgrade from version to version to version. Um, and this is kind of just an, a picture of, of what it looks like in our, in our deploy pipeline. So when we kind of release a new version of Salvis, um, we, we test on all systems and ensure that there's back, backward compatib compatibility is maintained. And of course, sometimes we did something wrong and something breaks, as you can see here in this, this big X down in merge tutorials. And when this happens, of course, we can't release. We need to make sure everything works. So we go back, fix it before we actually will release a new version. So we, we really hope to continue to, su to support and enable science uh, and research in, in earth science and other communities kind of through the provision of a professional and robust software that kind of goes beyond the, the, the actual study of the forward problem and more onto the actual application work that certain scientists are interested in. Um, now, as we are, a, 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 we become a spinoff and are a, a commercial company now, um, we of course, you know, we, we need to operate as a business. That being said, we, we do offer heavy discounts for academic use. So, and then we, we always find a solution. So um, if you're interested, of course, um, you can see on Friday what's going on and, uh, and um, yeah. Okay, so in the last minute or so, I just wanna give a brief overview of what we're gonna do on Friday. So what we're going to try and do, and of course this really depends on exactly how many resources are available and how the machine behaves at, at scale, is we wanna do a continental scale full waveform inversion from scratch. Um, so what that means is that we basically prepared a, a data set from, from Iris or a, and other da data servers, which are, which are living on the cluster that you've logged into. And we basically pre-selected some, some event. And what we want to do is go through there and, and go through what it takes kind of, you know, as a scientist to, to select windows, to compute adjoint sources, to iteratively update the model, to do QC on the data, and to, um, to go forward and actually uh, resolve a 3D model using real data um, of, of the European area. So uh, you can kind of see a little teaser of, of, of what we'll get to, um, but essentially it's, it's this, um, to, to, really, to really show um, what's kind of involved in, in those papers that, that, that push out new uh, away from inversion models. Um, quick overview of the instructors. Um, so it'll be Christian Boom, Leon Krischer and myself. And the, in addition to showing what we look like, I think these pictures also kind of show our personalities a bit. So take from that what you will, but uh, we'll all be happy to, uh, to help you on Friday and are looking forward to that tutorial and, and what everyone else has prepared in the next couple of days. So I think now it's lunchtime, um, but of course, happy to take questions too. And of course you can, we'll be here on Friday. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Maybe we can take a quick question and maybe do the rest during lunch break if necessary. So question, please. Hmm. Apparently no questions. Last chance. Okay, so I guess uh, there's one in the chat. Oh, sure. So the question is, what do you need to do in order to set up Solvus Flow on a new HPC cluster? 
Um, so this, of course, depends on, on the cluster, but um, in a built, built in is basically support for interacting with various queuing systems uh, like Slurm, PBS, um, and, and, and several others. Um, there's a configurable input file that you that you store on your local machine and you give it access to um, which paths you want you install Salvos on, where you want to submit output data and where you want to, to collect receivers. Um, and then you'll uh, go through and, and actually initialize the site, um, which will attempt to run a small simulation on the site um, in the debug queue and basically kind of do everything that would be required for larger simulations. And if that finishes correctly, um, that configuration is saved, and then you can use that as a as a site. And, and what that means is just from your Python process, um, so select the, the name that you called that site, and the uploading and downloading will handle be handled for you. And if it doesn't work, um, it should uh, uh, pop up a message saying, I couldn't do this thing. Um, please adjust your configuration accordingly. Um, and, and, and then you can proceed from there. Of course, in this case, we, we also, I mean, we want to make sure this works for you. So we, we, do, we do help out with this. There's another question on the slides um, where they are available. We can try to put them onto the uh, Cheese website where you find the program. And I would collect them and I would try to put them there as quickly as possible. Maybe we can also upload them in the Slack. I think you can place files there as well. Maybe that's even quicker. Okay, and then I would say, um, let's go for lunch. Uh, we will start at, oh no, before going for lunch, um, can we retry the group picture? Because actually we didn't really have a good picture so maybe if I can ask everybody again to uh, enable their video if they want to do that. And then I can take a few Moku pictures. So maybe some of you can also take group pictures and then later we just see which is the nicest one. Give me more minutes. So I'm almost done. So I think I have sufficient pictures now. Almost everybody had the camera open this time. Perfect, so let's uh, reconvene at one o'clock. Again, I would suggest that you leave the Zoom session open, if that's okay. Um, just want to avoid that 60 persons try to log in at the same time and I have to click everybody on. Okay, then at one o'clock, we continue. See you then, bye. <laughs>